In short, the whole town was full of rumors about the dead souls and the governor's daughter, about Chichikov and the dead souls, about the governor's daughter and Chichikov. Everyone grew agitated, and the usually sleepy town looked as if a tornado had struck. Slugs who hadn't removed their slippers and dressing gowns for years, sometimes blaming the shoemaker for their too narrow shoes, sometimes their tailor, sometimes their drunkard of a coachman, now came crawling out of their lairs. In fact, everyone came crawling out, even those who couldn't be lured out of their abodes by an invitation to a 500-ruble dinner that included such items as a six-foot sturgeon and mouth-watering meat pies. It turned out that the town was quite large and thickly populated. Citizens with names like Sisoy Penetievich and McDonald Karlovich, whom nobody had ever heard of, crawled out of their holes. Somebody abnormally tall with an arm full of gunshot became a permanent fixture in the local drawing rooms. The streets, teeming with incredible-looking vehicles, were a real witch's cauldron. At another time, under different circumstances, it is possible that these rumors wouldn't have had such an impact. It may be accounted for in this case by the fact that the town had been starved for news for a long time. Nothing had taken place there, nothing fit for what in Moscow and Petersburg is called Kameroj, which is just as important as the food supply. After a while, it became apparent that local opinion was split roughly down the middle, that two lines of thought had formed, embodied in two parties, the male and the female. The male party made the least sense and concentrated its attention on the dead souls. The female party put the emphasis on the abduction of the governor's daughter. It must be said in all honor to the ladies that this party was much more disciplined and better briefed. This was apparently due to the fact that the ladies were natural organizers and were used to running households. In no time, everything was well-defined, took on a clear and tangible form, was accounted for, and an overall final picture was produced. It appears, according to this picture, that Chichikov had been in love with the girl for some time, that they used to meet in the garden by moonlight, that the governor would have given his consent to the marriage long ago, Chichikov being fantastically rich, if it hadn't been for the fact that Chichikov had a wife he'd deserted. How they found out that Chichikov was married, no one knew. This wife, still hopelessly in love with him, had written a very moving letter to the governor, and seeing that the parents of his beloved would never give in their consent, Chichikov had decided to elope. In some houses, the version varied slightly. According to this one, Chichikov had no wife, but being a subtle man and wanting to ensure that the girl's hand be granted him, he had decided to begin with the mother. So he started by having a secret love affair with her, and only afterward made clear his intentions concerning her daughter. But the mother, fearing a mortal sin and feeling internal pangs of conscience, refused him her daughter's hand. And this was what had pushed Chichikov into his plan to elope with the girl. Amplifications, additions, and revisions were added to all this as it trickled down to the humbler parts of town. In Russia, the lower classes are avidly interested in society scandals, and so Chichikov's affairs were debated in shacks by people who had never set eyes on him, and they too had their own commentary and explanations. The topic became more and more absor absorbing as more and more details were added until in its final form it reached the ears of the governor's wife herself. The governor's wife, as the mother of a family, the first lady of the town and a well-bred lady, had never suspected anything of the sort and was greatly insulted and indignant, for which she had excellent reasons. The poor fair-haired child had as unpleasant a face-to-face -face talk with her mama as any 16-year-old is ever likely to have. Torrents of questions, admonitions, threats, reproaches, lectures were poured on the poor child, so that she burst into tears and sobbed, unable to understand what it was all about. The hall porter was given the strictest orders not to admit Chichikov at any time under any pretext. Having achieved their objective concerning the governor's wife, the ladies tried to pressure the male party into adopting their line too, claiming that the dead souls were nothing but a device to divert attention so that the abduction might be carried off successfully. Many men were convinced and joined the female party despite vigorous heckling from their former party associates, who called them old women, skirts, and other names that are known to be particularly offensive to persons belonging to the male sex. 
But no matter what efforts the male party made or how stubbornly it resisted, it was not nearly so disciplined as its rival. Everything in this party was coarse, unpolished, clumsy, ill-fitting, not right. Their thinking was muddled, hesitant, contradictory, and untidy. In short, there was ample evidence of the male's hollow, crude, cumbersome nature, of his incapacity to run a household, of his innate lack of aptitude for deep emotional conviction, of his unreliability, laziness, constant doubt, and eternal fears. The males contended that the whole elopement business was nonsense and would be more likely carried off by a hussar than a civilian. They said Chichikov would never do such a thing, that the women were lying, that a woman is a bag that carries around everything put into it, that the crux of the matter was the business of dead souls, which, though the gentlemen were damned if they knew what it all meant, nevertheless suggested something evil, something to no good end. Why the men suspected something evil and to no good end about the whole dead souls business, we shall find out right away. A new governor general for the province had been appointed, an event that's bound to alarm government officials because of the inevitable shake-ups, dressings down, tellings off, and other entertainments a superior can stage for his subordinates. Well, the officials reasoned, the new governor general has only to discover the stupid rumors circulating in this town, and that alone will make him seethe with anger. The health inspector suddenly turned pale. He had begun to suspect that the word, that the words, dead souls, might mean the large number of hospital patients who had died of an epidemic fever without anything being done to re prevent it spreading, and that Chichikov was an agent of the governor general's office sent out to make a secret investigation. He made his fears known, in part, to the president of the district court, The president reassured him, telling him that he was talking nonsense and suddenly went pale himself, for he had begun to wonder what would happen if the souls bought by Chichikov were really dead when he himself had sanctioned their purchase, acting, moreover, on that occasion, with Plushkin's power of attorney. And what would happen if this reached the governor general's ears? He didn't say a word about it to anyone but a friend or two. They also turned pale because fear is more contagious than the plague and is instantly communicated, everyone suddenly felt guilty of sins he'd never even committed. The phrase dead souls became so charged with all sorts of vague implica implications that the suspicion grew that they might refer to some bodies which had been hurriedly buried in connection with two recent incidents. The first incident concerned a party of merchants from Sovachugansk who had visited a fair in town and who, after attending the business, had thrown a party for a group of Ustsistolsk merchants. The party was in the Russian style, but had all sorts of foreign items such as cognacs, punches, liqueurs, and so forth. As usual, the feast ended in a fight. The merchants from Sovachugansk clubbed their guests to death, two of their own number receiving in the process, a good battering on the ribs, on the kidneys, and on the nose, which testified to the incredible size of the fists of the late lamented merchants. One of the visitors, one of the victors had, as fighting men put it, his button bashed in. That is, it was so flattened that nowhere did it project from his face more than a quarter of an inch. The surviving merchants admitted that they had gone a bit far. There were rumors that, in offering admissions of guilt, they made an additional offering of four government banknotes each. However, the case was very obscure. On further inquiry, it turned out that the Ust-Sistolsk merchants had really died of charcoal fumes, and they were buried as the victims of defective ventilation. The second incident occurred when the government-owned peasants of the hamlet of Lousy Pride joined with peasants of the same category from the hamlet of Troublesome and exterminated the, quote, local police, end of quote, in the person of one Drobyazhkin, who was also a tax collector. Their action was motivated by the fact that the, quote, local police, end of quote, 
i.e. the above-mentioned Drobyashkin, had taken to coming to their hamlets too often, its visits sometimes being about as pleasant as an epidemic of the plague, because the, quote, local police, end of quote, had a great weakness for peasant women and girls. And although nothing was clearly established, in their depositions the peasants claimed openly that the, quote, local police, end of quote, was as lecherous as a tomcat, that they had warned him several times before, and that on one occasion the, quote, local police, end of quote, had had to be kicked stark naked out of a peasant hut where it had been improperly located. There is no doubt that the, quote, local police, end of quote, deserved to be disciplined for its weaknesses, although the peasants of lousy pride and troublesome couldn't be condoned for taking justice into their own hands, assuming they'd actually taken part in the killing. But the whole affair was confused. The, quote, local police, end of quote, was found in a ditch. Its tunic or coat, it was impossible to tell which by then, looking more like a rag than anything else. And as to the face, it was completely unrecognizable. The case went from the lowest courts on up until it at last reached the higher district court where the decision was reached that it was not known which of the peasants had actually taken part in the killing because there were so many of them and that, on the other hand, as Drobyezhkin was now a deceased person, he couldn't possibly derive any very substantial advantage even if he won the case, while the peasants, being alive, had a very direct interest in a favorable verdict. Thus, taking everything into consideration, the following decision was reached. Tax collector Drobyezhkin was himself responsible for the event by oppressing the peasants of lousy pride and troublesome and... As to the circumstances of his demise, there was presumption that he had suffered an apoplectic stroke when returning home in his sleigh. The case seemed to have been neatly closed, and yet, God knows why, some officials started to wonder if the present furor about dead souls had anything to do with it. Now, as things will happen at the very moment when the official seemed already in some difficulty, the governor received two communications at the same time. In one of these, he was informed that from certain information and reports obtained, it has transpired that a forger was operating in the province, that he was hiding under various aliases, and that the matter was being duly investigated. The other communication came from the governor of a neighboring province and referred to an escaped bandit. It requested that any suspicious person found without proper documents should be detained immediately. These two communications had a stunning effect on one and all. They knocked the stuffing out of earlier surmises and suppositions. Of course, the communications could not have had any connection with Chichikov. Still, each person thought, after all, no one actually knows who Chichikov really is. Chichikov himself was quite vague about his own person. True, he'd said that he had suffered in his career for always telling the truth, but that was very vague indeed. And then they remembered that he'd mentioned that he had many enemies who'd even made attempts on his life. That made them think even more. If his life had been threatened, if people had a grudge against him, He must surely have done something. And who was he, after all? Of course, it was impossible to imagine him counterfeiting banknotes, and even less to consider him the escaped bandit. He looked much too respectable for that. But who was he, then? Now the town officials started asking themselves the question they ought to have asked at the beginning of this narrative, i.e., in Chapter 1. It was decided that those who had sold Chichikov the dead souls should be questioned to find out what kind of purchase had been made and what actually was meant by dead souls on the chance that he had told one of them, if only vaguely, about his real intentions or who he really was. First, the town officials contacted Mother Korobachka. They learned very little from her. He had bought, she told them, 15 rubles worth of souls, but was interested in feathers too and had promised, moreover, to buy many other products and also to purchase her lard on behalf of the government. Now she believed he was a crook. 
because she had had experience with a similar man who used to buy feathers from her and purchase her lard for the government, but who had finally swindled her, and the deacon's wife too, from whom he had extorted 100 rubles. She added much more, but it was just a repetition of what she'd already said, and the officials realized she was a stupid old bag. Manilov, who was approached next, declared that he could answer for Pavel Ivanovich Chichikov just as he could answer for himself, and that he would gladly give all his estates for one hundredth of Chichikov's virtues. He described him in the most flattering terms and threw in toward the end a few thoughts on friendship and affection with his eyes already half-closed. These ideas, while quite satisfactorily accounting for the tender expression on his face, failed to provide the officials with an explanation of the matter at hand. Sobakevich informed them that, in his opinion, Chichikov was all right, and that he had sold him a choice lot of peasants, people absolutely alive in every respect. Of course, he said, he couldn't guarantee what would happen in the future. He declined all responsibility of all of them. And he also declined all responsibility if all of them died during the trip to the place where they were to be resettled. That was in the hands of God, and besides, there were many fevers and deadly diseases around, as well as instances of whole villages dying out to a man. Then the officials used another method, not a very elevated one, but one that sometimes employed. They tried to get information on the side, that is, through various flunky intermediaries. They tried questioning Chichikov's servants about earlier circumstances of their master's life. But they weren't too successful here, either. From Petrushka, they got nothing but a whiff of his stale aroma. And from Selifan, that Chichikov used to be in the government and that he'd had some connection with the customs service. That was all. This kind of person has a very odd habit. If you ask him something directly, he never remembers. But if you ask him about something completely different, he may tell you what you wish to know in the first place in connection with nothing much. And then he'll tell you even more details than you bargained for. Thus, all that the officials found out from these inquiries was that they didn't know anything for certain about Chichikov, but that he certainly must be something or other. They decided to meet and air this subject thoroughly. To decide what they should do about him, how they should go about it, what measures they should adopt, and what sort of a man he was. That is, to decide whether he should be arrested as a dangerous felon or whether he was in a position to have them all arrested as dangerous felons. They planned to meet at the house of the police chief, the father and benefactor of the people, with whom we're already acquainted.